It takes not just willingness, but it takes intentional, directional willingness that has a focus to it and, as I just said, a direction to it. It's oriented towards some place that is desired in order for the person to really not be sidetracked because there's going to be, there will be definitely many obstacles standing in the way of them attaining any of the stages of the Dhamma, supramundane stages, beyond jhanas. Because on the way they will come across different types of teachers and teachings that for some reason, for one reason or the other, not necessarily just coming or pertaining to the teacher, but also a lot of it having to do with the student and what they feel comfortable, whether they like to challenge their own mental, spiritual uh, status quo or not. And proceed from there. Otherwise, be stuck there. What I would like to call stuck horizontally. Exploring this and that simply because they want to dance and, and celebrate you know, on their laurels the little that they have tasted which the mind can really magnify and say, ah, oh, it is huge, it is great, this is the best, this is the best, this is the best that I can do. And there are many teachers out there who themselves have reached a certain level, or not, but let's presume they have, and because they might have tiny little snippets, grains of truth in what they're saying, and nothing more, they would attract some students, and they start celebrating the fact that the students are there, so therefore it ricochets back and forth, it reverberates, and that gives them the illusion that they themselves are going still vertically. Meanwhile, they are not, because they parked the car, they pitch the tent, they kick off their shoes, spiritual shoes, and they call it a day, and they start celebrating wherever they are, without going any farther, meaning their status quo, which creates a deep sense of resentment within themselves, and in some cases, even these teachers will bring down, shoot down, interrogate, or, or intimidate, rather, in one way or the other, the students who will not be satisfied anymore with those tiny little grains of wisdom, which they will outgrow. At this point, the student has become greater than the teacher. Many teachers are afraid of this. This has been going on for ages in human history. But specifically when you come to the Dhamma, you see this a lot. We've suffered a lot and we are suffering. The Dhamma is actually suffering the most because of this. Now I'm talking about the small pockets of teachers that do have something still left valuable in their teaching compared to just the traditional ways, you know, monastics, this and that, and you know, in, 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 uh, communities and uh, Buddhist uh, communities in different part of the, parts of the world where it's just the ritual that is left, just the memorization, just the chantings, etc., that are left. Years ago, when I used to work in jewelry as a child, an apprentice, uh, learning how to become a goldsmith, you would work with once you 
have trained enough and you're working with actual pieces of gold. We used to work with 18 karat, uh, 18 karat gold, which is purer version. Anyhow, um, you would whatever piece you are working with, uh, it's grosser. It's it's much more sturdy, rugged, uh, sharper at the edges, especially if it's a piece that has been cast into gold, which means it has chunks of it left. We call them branches and things. So you have to use rougher equipment to file those down. And as you did that, you would have different categories of uh, rasps or uh, um, filers or files, the things that the pieces of metal, and they are designed to soften as you rub them against, as you strike them against the, the opposite metal, the object, meaning in this case the gold. So you would have bigger, more uh, grosser kinds of these files, and then slowly, slowly they would get so refined, tiny little uh, very small and slender, you would actually feel as much uh, tenderness from you as you're holding on to this tiny little file as you would with the gold piece. Meanwhile, as you're working on the piece, the gold itself is becoming more beautiful, more delicate, because all those harder edges have been filed down, and now the final piece is coming through, showing up. So we started with the grosser things, uh, equipment, tools that we use. Uh, and, and meanwhile, think of it in a, as, as a spectrum, a line where you have two extremes. The two extremes represent the hardness, the hard, heavy duty, like a saw or something like that, and a big file and things. On the opposite side, you have a big chunk of gold. And then slowly, slowly, as they come to meet into the center, they have been using, at least the gold was, the tools that have been softer and equally softer and more deliberate, more refined tools. Similarly, the gold was responding to that as it came to its fruition, as it came to its fulfilled, fulfilled state, the intended state. Now, take this analogy and superimpose it on the journey of a person who seeks one's own liberation, intending on living the holy life completely by reaching the state of supreme Nibbana. On the way, if they have the necessary uh, energy, desire, because Nibbana does require a tremendous amount of desire. Desire is not something that the Dhamma or Buddhism is against. Most people have that mistaken notion. So they have to have the aditana or the, that determination. They need to have a whole bunch of things. And consistent effort, of course. But on their journey, they will meet, they will come across certain teachers who will help them at some stage even if they're very bad teachers, at least if they're applying their wisdom, the student that is, uh, sooner or later, by comparison and contrasting with um, the ideal teacher, meaning the Buddha, within uh, the suttas, they will identify whether this teacher deserves to be their teacher or not. And if this teacher is the grosser kind, guess what's going to happen? It's going to be dropped because they've done their job. Now the student moves on to the next. If they have that intentional, directional will. Will is not enough. Anyone can have a will. But the intensity of that will needs to be properly uh, calibrated to fit the goal and some students have to work harder than others because they've done their work in, in the past 
And now they are coming closer and closer. But as they're coming closer and closer, these are the individuals who will not pitch the tent. They will not kick off their shoes. Uh, they will not settle with this teacher or that simply because the teacher is an interesting speaker or they have a great following or there's a big promise here if I stick around with this teacher because apparently many of his students have become awakened. At least that's the word on the street, if you will. Meanwhile, you go and speak if the student is smart and if the teacher is really uh, not uh, that genuine, let's, let's just say that, unless they're a very good student, they will be taken by the news that or the information that's been spreading and that propaganda and give up the real desire for which they started on their journey in the first place and they will go after the signposts the tiny little mundane not super mundane mundane worldly goals because we are social beings after all and oftentimes we find ourselves seeking approval in one form or another and there's many issues there that an individual even one who is directed or desiring to attain Nibbana they need to negotiate some other issues that they've had since childhood at least in this life certain inadequacies that Mara can take really make really good use of to hinder the progress create that obstacle and the student is now stuck just like that teacher whether it was a genuine teacher or not but if they're not moving vertically up versus horizontally scurrying about and just picking a little bit of this a little bit of that and then coming up with different explanations of this and that wasting valuable time unless the person is doing the work instead of engaging in intellectual acrobatics analysis of this or that writing about the Dhamma instead of living the Dhamma then they are lost. They have wasted another life because they took the bait, the bait of Mara. Because they now have some following and they think, wow, I made it. I am there. No, you're not there. You're so far off. You're not even on the path anymore. That's how many teachers are actually um, living their lives and their reward is that meager sense of satisfaction when they find a few people listening to them religiously so this is a, a call for heedfulness for those students who still have that ability in their hearts that desire that pure desire in their hearts to go ahead and pierce through the mire, pierce through the fog, to pierce through the delusion. Any teacher who sees that a student is not progressing fast enough and not say anything, I call that person an agent of Mara, an agent of the evil one. Mara that we see in the Theravada tradition, in Buddhism, in the Dhamma, because the teacher has not only not walked through the doorway into Nibbana, didn't do their work that they're supposed to, but they're getting credit for the work that they should have done, but 
they sell themselves so well that they not only not walk through the doorway and attain, but they now obstruct others to walk through the doorway as well by having them be sidetracked, also be amused by what is around them horizontally versus saying, go for it. I sometimes remember Alara Kalama and Uddha Karamaputta, the two teachers that Siddhartha Gautama went to one after the other, after he attained the first uh, teacher's uh, highest level of attainment, which was the seventh jhana, which is the realm of nothingness. And then he goes and speaks to the teacher, is this it, is this it? But, but how come there is greed still? How come there is still delusion, ignorance? How come there is hatred? Loba dosa moha. And the teachers had the audacity the honesty, the truthfulness to tell this student who was seeking, who was going vertically, even though the teacher was stuck on a horizontal plane, let's call that, that this, the teacher did not dissuade nor tell, no, 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 forget about the vertical path, forget about going after Nibbana and becoming free from these three poisons, Loba Dosa Moha. They didn't do that. They said, Unfortunately, this is the level that we have attained only, and beyond this we do not know. And they gave him the blessing to move forward and leave them. Today, many of these mundane teachers freak out, panic, when they see a student question the teacher's level of understanding. Not when they are being disrespectful, of course, but simply by the student asking some critical questions that they have not found it, them to be answered by this teacher. I've actually seen teachers who get upset in the middle of a retreat more than once, yelling at students and demeaning, patronizing the student and coming across making it look like it's the student's fault. Well, what do you think the student's going to do? They'll just put their hands in Anjali and they say, I'm sorry, or not continue on the line of questions that they still have not answered. The teachers haven't answered. Agents of Mara. That's what the teacher has become versus somebody like Alara Kalama or Uddha Karamaputta, the second teacher, the final teacher that Siddhartha Gautama went to before setting off on his own and eventually attaining Nibbana. Both of them were so humble enough to say, come, let's, why don't you become the teacher or why don't we co-teach? Because of his intensity, his intentional, directional will, that power of seeking the truth, which is far greater than the teacher, far greater than anything, because it has not yet been attained. And the only way they could attain that is if they go vertically, not skulk around, not stick around, enjoying these pebbles, these tiny little, you know, there's, there's fool's gold. Many people used to be caught, you know, their greed, and they would give up a whole wealth seeking out, thinking that it's gold, but it was fool's gold. It looks like gold, but only a goldsmith or an expert would actually tell you that this is not. So you have a lot of students who are going and being stuck with quasi-realizations. And now, it's not just a teacher, who's counting and dancing on his laurels or her laurels, but it's also the student. That makes the teacher an agent of Mara.
One has, has to pierce through ignorance. And ignorance is the last sanyojana, which is the last fetter, last, the higher five fetters. The very last is ignorance. Another one is conceit. Many teachers and students get stuck there. If they get that far, that is. One has to be a warrior of truth. That is something that Mara has no weapons against. I think that is enough.